Hello, how are you doing? My name is Jonathan James and welcome to this classical roadmap on female composers. In a way, it's a companion piece to a recent talk I did on composers of colour. And if you're wondering where to find these talks, then please do go to the Arts Active website where they are archived, or in fact, my YouTube channel where you'll find talks of this nature and more. So these talks are all about maybe disrupting your listening habits, provoking you, but also just winding it and introducing you to names that you perhaps haven't heard before. And I think that's going to be the case with my selection today of six female composers. There'll certainly be some names I think you'll recognise, but others that I hope you won't, and that you'll be introduced to a whole new world. So what is the situation currently with female composers? Can't we be gender blind? you might say, just as we'd like to be colourblind when it comes to listening and appreciating our music. Well, on one level we should be, exactly. We should just be listening to the music on its own terms. But actually, when you look at the industry, there are some pretty stark statistics out there. Turns out I was in a little bit of a positive, shiny bubble. I thought that um, things were looking bright, particularly here in the UK when I listen to Radio 3, I hear actually quite a lot of female composers there and I look at how orchestras are programming and hear anecdotally what's going on in terms of the agenda behind the programming and it seems that there is a better representation. Long way to go yet, but a better representation um, of female composers there. However, how wrong I was. I have a stark statistic here from um, the Women in Music report that was taken from a survey um, in 2018 and 19, uh, that season, 18 to 19 I should say, of 22 major American orchestras. So we're talking about the US here, quite conservative programming scene maybe, but all the same you'd have thought pretty enlightened, particularly when it comes to female composers. You'd have thought that, right? So can you guess what percentage of the composers that were performed by these 22 major American orchestras were female in that season? It's very recent, isn't it? It's just prior to the major lockdown. I thought, I don't know, about 20% maybe? Is that fair? Shows what a bubble I was in. 3.4%. That's it. 3.4. It's miserly. So we've got a heck of a long way to go. When I say we, actually, the states have in their programming. Pleased to say, here in the UK at least, that the proms and the Aldborough festivals, and major classical festivals, have committed to a 50-50 balance uh, in their gender balance programming. Um, so that, at least, is positive. I was looking at a list on the Oxford University Press of composers, uh, female composers, in the 1800s. Can you name a few? Perhaps Clara Schumann comes up? Interesting though, isn't it, with Clara, how she's often um, appreciated through the lens of her relationship to her male counterparts, such as Brahms or, of course, Schumann. But apart from being an amazing pianist, she was a, a wonderful composer in her own right. Then we've got Louise Farenc. I heard uh, some chamber music for her has been programmed on Radio 3 yesterday. Brilliant. And then Cecile Chaminard. That's three names out of 128 that I recognised in the same way that I might recognise, say, uh, a 19th century composer such as Berlioz or Chopin or Mendelssohn, so the male counterparts. It's not very many, is it? And I'm, I'm drawn to this quote here by Marion Alsop, um, the... Uh, women conductor, and she says that you can't have sustained success without sustained failure. And that's an interesting quote, isn't it? I think she's absolutely right. There is kind of less at stake in a way for a new male composer than there is for a female composer. They can perhaps fail and be allowed to fail in a way that a female composer can't. She's not given the same amount of repeat um, exposure on the concert platform um, and there are perhaps different criteria set around the success of premieres when it comes to female composers. Discuss. 
You can't have sustained success without sustained failure. We need to give this new body of work by female composers uh, much more of a chance to breathe and for people to experiment and find their footing. So with that in mind, shall we plunge into my list now of six composers that I think you'll absolutely love. Let's go into here. I'm gonna start with what I hope will be quite a familiar name to you, Lily Boulanger, Marie-Antoinette Olga Boulanger, to use her full name, uh, Lily for short. She only lived for 24 years, 24 brilliant but you know, tragically short years. Um, she had uh, a very blessed upbringing, musically speaking, where she was serenaded by Maurice Ravel as a child. Uh, Gabriel Fauré noticed that she had perfect pitch by the fact that she would wander around as a toddler uh, singing, apparently all the time. We learn from her sister, who is the famous pedagogue, Nadia Boulanger, that she was forever singing and forever immersed in her musical world. I mentioned Nadia there, um, who was famous for her forthright opinions um, when it comes to compositional technique and for helping out pretty much anybody who was anybody in the 20th century when it comes to the composing world. And uh, it took a little while for Lily to emerge from Nadia's shadow, and that is part of her story, even though she had a talent that burned so brightly um, she immediately grabbed the attention of people. A beautiful woman um, with immense talent that was obvious right from the get-go. She eventually um, won the coveted Prix de Rome in 1913. Her sister, Nadia, tried for it, I think, four times, but uh, wasn't successful. But Lily got there, and that immediately put her onto an international platform. And from then, she set to work in a variety of genres, from choral and vocal through to orchestral, and she came up with 50 works in a very, very short life before she died, um, really, of Crohn's disease. She suffered with that throughout her life, and despite that, had this uh, incredible tenacity, a tenacity that not only led her to continue to compose, but also to set up concerts for soldiers and in aid of the war effort when it broke out, the First World War, of course, in her lifetime. So um, let's just look at some of those works. I always think, actually, when I'm listening to Lily Boulanger, uh, that there's this moment of unexpected radiance when something happens in the score that you're not expecting. And often that's to do with the harmony, which is a kind of a mix between late Foray and Wagner and Lily's unique voice. Let me just give you an example from her Nocturne. And here I think we're going from looking into a dark sky to realising that it's a beautiful starry night. Just listen to this. So far, so foray, right? Very French, and then... A moment of ecstasy and musical radiance. And then comes this beautiful sequence of musical colours. Halfway through this short but poignant work, Nocturne for violin and piano. Um, absolutely beautiful in terms of the harmonies and the surprises that it, you know, that are around every sort of corner. So she excelled really at every genre that she touched. Um, and for me, the most familiar works are the orchestral ones, where she has such an assured touch with the orchestra, and it's post-impressionist, so very, very colourful, lots of detail, very clear and transparent, wispy, almost vivacious, 
And I'm thinking of this pair of orchestral works, Dans Matin de Printemps, Spring Morning, and A Sad Evening, Dans Soir Triste. They're often paired, but um, I've heard them. In fact, it's one of those phenomena, I think, that once you hear a work, suddenly you hear it everywhere being programmed. Certainly that was the case for me for Dans Matin de Printemps. Um, it's a very immediately appealing work. Uh, very lyrical and, as I say, very colourful in terms of the orchestration. Then we should mention the choral works, particularly Psalm 129, uh, and a, a, a deeply troubling and dark, actually, opening to that. Um, and then she has an old Buddhist prayer, une vieille prière buddhique, which is an intoxicating piece, slowly builds. I wanted, though, just to share a moment from a song cycle that she wrote called Glades in the Sky, Lights in the Sky, Clairières dans le ciel, written 1913 to 14, so four years before she died. And there are 13 songs there, which might strike you as an odd number, but apparently, well, actually, she has 13 letters in her name, Lily Boulanger, count them, that makes 13. And she identified very strongly with the heroine of the poems on which this cycle is based. So um, it's a cycle by the poet Francis Jeanne, spelled J-A-M-M-E-S, I should have put his name there, very sorry. And he's a symbolist poet, she was very drawn to symbolism in general, in terms of the literary expression of that. And um, I think that is a perfect match for the mystical qualities of her writing. So she associates herself with the heroine, who is this tall, rather mystical character in herself, very elusive, and the set of poems describe the sense of deep loss and regret that the poet has um, at having lost this wonderful, mysterious woman who just disappears from his life all of a sudden. I'm going to pick up with uh, one of the songs towards the end of the cycle. And there's this lovely line, um, you looked at me a long while like a blue sky. I love the expanse of that. And I think that comes across in the music that seems to have the wafting qualities of clouds as they just gently cross the sky. Let me just start it for you here. Um, I'm just going to go back to the other playlist. Sorry, bear with me. Here we go. This playlist, by the way, is on Spotify. If you want to look for my name, Jonathan James, and you'll find uh, this playlist and, in fact, the playlist for all the talks that I do. Um, this is called Arts Active Female Composers. So, here we go. This is Vous m'avez regardé uh, avec toute votre âme, when you looked at me with all your soul. Some gentle cloud-like motion. That's the blue sky moment. I put your regard into the shade of my eyes. A literal and rather not or non-poetic, unpoetic translation. Sorry for that. But that comes across in the music. Again, it's the subtlety of it. Uh, each song has an integrity to it in terms of the style and form. And uh, yeah, just a wonderful connection with the words that is, is really quite subtle. I suppose the last one of that set is the most poignant. 
Uh, it acts as a summary of all the themes, musical and otherwise, in the song cycle. But I commend this cycle to you very warm-heartedly. It's clairière, or clairière, these uh, senses of light and space in the sky. Another person who enjoyed writing for voice was Grace Williams, uh, a Welsh composer. I thought it was important to have at least one representative of uh, the Welsh homeland, given that this talk is for St David's Hall in Cardiff. Uh, Grace Williams, a wonderful character, actually, really warm-hearted and down-to-earth. There's a lovely interview of hers that is recorded in the archive on um, the T. Kerth website, the music of as uh, the House of Music website, and she comes across as this uh, very unaffected, very um, just pragmatic composer, almost um, untroubled by prejudice. It would seem she says explicitly, you know, I never had any problems as a female composer at the Royal College of Music or afterwards within Wales. So she felt unaffected by that, which is positive at least, isn't it? She was born in Barry and had a love for the sea, which comes out in her work, but apparently as a child, she was often to be found there, just dreaming at the seaside, listening to its sounds and imagining how that could work their way into the music. She went to London to work, but notably came back to Barry um, and spent the rest of her life there. So she had uh, a fantastic formal training at the Royal College of Music under Gordon Jacobs um, and Ralph Vaughan Williams. That's the RVW there in that bullet point. And then she went on to have some more tuition in Vienna. And after that, soon had commissions coming in for her in London. She was uh, the first Welsh symphonist and the first female British composer, at least, to score uh, a feature film, which is rather exciting. Now, do I have the name of said? I know some of you will want this. Blue Seas. There we go. Blue Seas. And that was in 1949. So it won't surprise you that Welsh folk music um, features also prominently in her work, either explicitly in terms of the harp and uh, vocal music that she composes uh, based directly on Welsh folk song or evoking the quality of folk song, or perhaps less directly than that, as is the case in Penillion, which was written in 1955 for the National Youth Orchestra of Wales. It's a lovely tone poem in four movements, and Penillion or Canny Penillion is a kind of folk singing uh, native to Wales, and it's verse singing that has an element, I'm told, I'm no expert, of improvisation. And so she references that world and that folk world in this orchestral piece, which is just great fun. Uh, I should mention before we just dip into it that um, one of my favourite choral works for her is well, it's a direct reflection of the motion of the sea, and it's called Ave Maris Stella. And you get the ebb and flow of the waves in the choir, and it's beautifully realised. So um, let me just give you a sense of Grace Williams' style, which is direct and accessible, and it works a treat for this Welsh youth orchestra. So this is the second movement. Some listeners, when they first heard that, said that it reminded them of Bartok and things like the Romanian dances. 
I think that's a bit of a stretch, to be honest. Although I did see that some researchers have gone out to actually explore the connections between uh, Hungarian folk music and Welsh folk music. And apparently there is some, although not on the evidence, I think, of what we've just heard there. Um, but certainly you have that rhythmic quality and, and folkloric quality that you might associate with Barsuk as well. But for me, it's not those faster movements that particularly capture my ear, but rather the slower ones. And there's this middle movement called the Andante con Tristezza, so a slow movement or a walking pace at least, Andante with sadness, con Tristezza. And it's a simple theme just oscillating between two notes. Um, and it's how it develops over the chords beneath that I think is very, very special. Let me just show you how it starts. I hope you can hear that okay. There's, there's two notes. a beautiful song, a modal quality to it, so an ancient feel to it, just by virtue of the scale that it's using, but against the weightiness of those chords beneath. And there was about to be a lovely trumpet echo, the solo trumpet being a very important colour for Grace Williams, along with the harp, the bardic quality of the harp. Now, if you go slightly later on in that same movement, you get this intensity where that theme intertwines with another in the upper strings, and I think it's utterly beautiful. A mixture of pain and longing there coming in with that, that counter melody, beautifully sung by the violins. It's, I think, such clear writing, isn't it? Just those two lines coming together, but it worked beautifully together, beautifully crafted. That I had to find on YouTube, in case you're wondering where to find a recording of Benichlion. There are out there, um, in terms of the online availability, I had to go to YouTube for that, but I really commend it to you. I'm going to keep things Celtic now, or at least half Celtic, by talking about Thea Musgrave. And now we're going on to living composers, Thea born in 1928. Uh, she's Scottish, but Scottish-American, so a mixture of the two. And again, comes across as wonderfully down-to-earth in her interviews. If you go to the website, her website, there's a video interview and her character comes across as uh, someone who, um, again, rather like Grace Williams, is just very straightforward and pragmatic about her craft. Um, she talks about, for example, really going out of your way to get to know various different instrument uh, instrumentalists and say, look, what actually doesn't work for you? What is awkward? What, what doesn't sort of work well in terms of the fingering or the, uh, or the embouchure, whatever it is for the instrument? Um, and she works from that basis outwards. Let me tell you a little bit um, about her background. Um, she regales these stories of her past with a great sense of humour. Uh, she started off as a medic student, and it turns out that in Edinburgh, where you study medicine, that just across the road, there's a music school, and she found, in her own words, that um, cutting up frogs was uh, rather boring, and she ended up 
in the music school instead, listening to concerts, and from then on became um, completely absorbed by the world of music. She ended up four years under the, uh, or in the tutelage of Nadia Boulanger, you remember her from uh, the first slides, I hope, this wonderful pedagogue based in Paris. And again, there's this story of how Nadia Boulanger was a perfectionist in the sense that whatever you brought to her in her sessions, she expected every detail to be thoroughly thought through, nothing cavalier, but everything counted. And there's a story that uh, Thea tells of Boulanger's tuition that uh, Boulanger apparently says that you should be like a great jeweller when you compose. That is, a great jeweller creates a ring that, of course, looks beautiful in terms of its setting on the front, but also when you turn it over and you look at it from underneath, it's equally as beautiful. So the analogy being there with a the score that every detail needs to be able to hold up to that kind of scrutiny and belong to the beauty of the whole item. And there must be no stone left unturned in that sense. So a composer must be like a great jeweler. I love that. In the mid sixties, Thea Musgrave had a bit of a nightmare. And the nightmare was that she composed this beautifully formed piece, but right in the middle of it, a cheeky clarinetist decides to interrupt the proceedings gets up from their chair and starts blaring out whatever they want and chaos ensues. In the morning, she found that quite funny, in retrospect. And interestingly, she had in the post that very day a commission from the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. And so she decided to put this dream to good use by having an instrument, in this case it was going to be a clarinet, it would be her clarinet concerto, a clarinetist who would perform the role of that protagonist in a dream. So it would go around being a catalyst within the orchestra and just provoking small sections to play with them, to play against them, um, in the sense of a, a concerto, that concertare, to, to struggle against something. So you've got the clarinetist in that dramatic role of provoking. And she called this kind of writing, which would be uh, found in quite a few of her works, the dramatic abstract. So there is a theatrical, a dramatic quality to it, but no obvious story, so it remains in the abstract. Let's have a listen to a little bit of her clarinet concerto then. Um, I have to say actually her music is really quite playful often. Uh, I mentioned there in the second bullet point that she's got little picture postcards of Loch Ness and then the Japanese garden She's able, in this very versatile way, just to capture up completely different worlds um, in a very short moment in her music. But also playful. I remember listening to her seasons and there's a, uh, a jarring quote of the Star Spangled Banner that comes up, I think it's in summer. Here then is the prestissimo, the really fast movement from her clarinet concerto. And it starts with this burbling texture. So you can imagine the clarinetist having moved to the wind section and playing with them and with the percussion. It's very scampish, isn't it? I want you to listen to this bit where you have these horns coagulating together, building up and clotting underneath this nimble clarinet line. Um, I think it's a wonderful effect. And then you'll hear another mystery instrument, which I shall reveal later. This is just to make sure you're still with me, still listening and alert. This is an instru instrument you don't often find in the context uh, of an orchestra, let's just put it that way. So I'm going to go about two minutes in to this. Can you hear those horns in the background?
That's the instrument in the mix there. These lines that are just scaling upwards. Some tom toms there. Don't, those weren't the instruments actually, I was thinking about. Now, I don't know what the sound quality is like in this recording, but um, did you hear something strange in the mix? It was an accordion. That quite, um, it's a, a blade-like sound. It really cuts through. Uh, very interesting and not used in a folkloristic way at all in this context, but as if it were just a standard member of the orchestra. And I think that's really imaginative. I, I, I really love that. And there's a playfulness to that. So that movement is very will-o'-the-wisp, isn't it? Um, very ephemeral and just everything is shifting from bar to bar. I find it really arresting because of that. Really, really uh, full of incident and interest. Theo Musgrave. Here is uh, a famous Japanese print. Can you can you name the work with which it is associated? It was chosen to be on the front cover of the composer's school for this work by the composer himself. La Mer by Debussy. And that is the print uh, of the wave off Hokusai. And, uh, oh, actually, hang on, it, the, the artist is Hokusai, isn't it? And uh, I can't remember where the wave is <laughs> geographically. But anyway, this mythical wave that comes in. Now, I bring this up because I was listening to um, Radio 3 while doing my porridge, as is my wont. And I had to stop and almost burn the porridge when I heard this particular version of La Mer. What you're hearing is a piano trio version. It's a masterclass in transcription of taking a, a work that is a benchmark in the orchestral repertoire and set a whole new standard for orchestration um, at the turn of the century and reducing it somehow for three instruments while still encapsulating all of the detail of the score in, in this you know, piano, violin and, and cello. Absolutely amazing the imagination with which this composer has done it. Who was it? Well, Sally Beamish. Um, and I really have enjoyed Sally Beamish's work over the years, uh, not least because of how deft she is with colour and how great she is at encapsulating worlds of nature. I just, if you look down at the third um, bullet point there, there's a lovely video on her website of her going um, to this whirlpool in the Inner Hebrides. And apparently it's the biggest whirlpool of its kind in the world. And she's there in this ship, actually very brave of her, at the centre. And she can feel the centrifugal force as the water just swirls round and round. And they begin to go round and round, of course, at the centre as well. And she looks out and she describes the knots and flowers in the water's surface. And that becomes the basis for her piano concerto number two, which is called Cauldron of the Speckled Seas. That is a, a translation of the Scottish name for that whirlpool. So she's adventurous and she's got this wonderful way of, as I say, capturing natural phenomena in her music. Uh, she does that beautifully with Debussy, and she does that in her own original language as well. And there's another work just below that bullet point, Hover, it's called, and it's inspired by a falcon just wheeling and gliding. And it was in commemoration of Sir Neville Mariner, 
who conducted the Academy of St Martin in the fields where she was a violist. So um, I read that she had this horrible morning where she woke up one day and found that her Gabrielli viola that was on loan to her, this incredibly precious instrument, had been stolen and it was never to be returned. She expected to turn up at some dealer somewhere in the world, but apparently never has. And it was at that moment that she had this pivot point of saying, OK, um, maybe I should go into full time composing instead. We can be grateful for that in a way, um, for that uh, moment of realisation. And uh, she went on then to compose three concertos for the instrument and many other works that feature the viola prominently, which is a great thing in itself, because as you may well know, there aren't many viola concertos out there. Uh, but she has greatly added to that repertoire. She's based in Scotland um, and she brings in various traditional ideas from the folklore up there into her music, as you've seen with the piano concerto, just thematically, but also in terms of the musical material as well. And some bits of jazz now and then, which um, delights me as a, somebody who's very keen on jazz. I wanted to play to you um, a particularly delightful and very accessible piece of hers called Sea Vegas, which means Sea Fairers. And it's a collaborative piece with this um, Shetland fiddler called Chris Stout and his duo partner Catriona McKay on Scottish Harp. So there's space in the school that Sally Beamish has left for them to improvise a little bit and Apparently it was quite a, a, a nightmare recording it, for the producer at least, because every time they recorded it, of course they did something slightly different. So it's this, I won't say tightrope, but beautiful balance, let's say, between notated written work for a string ensemble and various lines for the two folk soloists, and then giving them that space just to take it into a new and very different world. There are three parts, storm, lament, and Haven. Uh, the storm starts with this dawn as the waves are rocking, rock, so rocking up against and lapping up against the boat. Um, let me just play you that. And then soon we get a storm of a different kind and out breaks this furious jig. It's brilliant writing and it's great fun to listen to. And that gets more and more furious as the storm gathers force. You then have a folk lament at the heart of this, let's call it a concerto, a double concerto for folk fiddle and harp. And then at the end, haven, which as you can imagine is more settled, but still full of energy. Very funky pizzicato going on.
Oh, get your headphones on and lock into that. It's beautiful, beautiful writing. I'm a real sucker for the power of folk music to take you to a centre place. Uh, I'm not Scottish. I am Celtic. <laughs> and you don't have to be. That's the point. You feel as if you're there and you feel as if you're being connected just by that language to something very, very deep and personal indeed. Sally Beamish, definitely worth listening to her back catalogue and she's still very active today. So I've stuck, haven't I, so far, um, with the exception of Lily Boulanger, to composers from our shores. Let's now go across the Atlantic for the final two composers, or at least for this first one. And um, I'm going to come to Jennifer Higdon. Have you heard about her? I haven't, actually. And um, we really should know more about Higdon, because apparently... She's one of the most programmed and performed American composers of current times. And that's saying something when you consider, you know, the minimalist giants of glass. Um, and uh, I suppose, well, let's not call John Adams a minimalist. Um, but, you know, John Adams is out there with all his works as well. And yet Jennifer Higdon is right up there at the top of the list. She writes um, in a very accessible way, but not in a facile way. Um, there's always uh, a real heart to what she does, whether it's chamber or orchestral. She won this Pulitzer Prize, one of many prizes, in fact, that she's won, uh, for the Violin Concerto in 2010. And that's the piece that I wanted to share with you today. Before I do that, I think it's interesting that she had really quite a liberal upbringing where she witnessed, as she puts it, how her father as a painter struggled with making uh, a living as an artist, but also just bringing uh, an idea into being, into, for him, a painting. And for her, that process then felt very natural. That's just what you did. And uh, it was a natural thing for her to do the same, but within the musical sphere. Her music has been described as neo-romantic, which means that you get uh, a nice warmth and lyricism to her melody. It's quite sparse though, that says, these open fifths, these are quite sort of bare intervals. And often when I'm listening to her work, it's characterised by um, light textures and transparency, this economy of scoring. Also, you're aware that the music is seemingly organically unfolding, as if one bar just naturally leads to the other because it's inevitable. It has to go there. And that might be just part of the uh, deceit of her craft. But, but actually, she talks about wanting things to develop naturally and not setting out with a specific design or form in mind. I think that comes across, particularly in the first movements, of her violin concerto, um, which sort of emerges, did I have it here on the playlist? I hope so. From these just sort of um, beautifully spaced harmonics played by the soloist. Let me just see if I can find it for you. Yeah, here we are. written for the soloist Hilary Hahn, who was a former student of Higdon's. In composition, I should add. Beautifully delicate filigree there in the percussion. Apparently in the school, um, the glockenspiel should be played with knitting needles. I haven't seen that before. And you get these tiny little crotales, so these kind of symbol-like instruments that tinkle. I'm going to go, though, to the virtuoso movement uh, called Fly Forward, the third movement. And it was there to demonstrate what Hilary Hahn could do on the instrument. And I've got the sense that uh, Hickerton might have been listening to Barber's violin concerto um, when she composed this, because that has this kind of motto perpetua, this constant stream of semiquavers, um, as we have here. It's called Fly Forward because apparently Higdon had a vision of the uh, Beijing Olympics. It was being 
films at the time when she was composing, she had a vision of Hilary Hahn racing in the Olympics and she wanted to somehow put that into the music. And certainly you've got this, this energy. Lots of mixed meter there and rhythmic fun and that's just five minutes of sheer exuberant joy. I'm not, I know you can't really hear it on this recording but please please go to the Spotify playlist and, and check it out there. Better still get the CD and, and pay money for it. <laughs> so that was Hilary Hahn playing the Barney Concerto by Higdon and it's a joy. All three movements are so captivating and just that final bullet point there of how closely Higdon worked with Hahn on crafting the writing, so it really suited the stretch, for example, of Hilary Hahn's, uh, she apparently has a very large stretch and intervallic reach on the instrument because she's got double jointed knuckles um, or something like that. <laughs> so that again is reflected in the writing, it's a real collaboration. So. Who will my final composer be today? Well, I wonder if you've heard of Anna Torvalds Dottir. She is an Icelandic composer and I had the distinct pleasure and privilege, I'm going to say privilege, of being able to interview her um, while on tour with the Icelandic uh, Symphony Orchestra. They were on tour in the UK and I got to sit down with Anna before quite a few concerts and I don't know if you were there in fact for the St David's um, performance but she has this utterly original mind and of course when we think of Iceland our stereotype is Björk isn't it and how quirky Björk is but if you can take some of that spirit and put it into the world of classical music then you have something, something of the way Anna thinks, something at least of the uniqueness um, and the way of phrasing things, the poetry of how she sees the world. So um, she's a very visual composer and she writes everything out with pencil, which I found absolutely astounding these days, you know, we've got so much software, particularly when you're writing primarily for orchestra, orchestra even, um, to do that with pencil is a real commitment but it speaks really about her aesthetic as a composer because she likes the feel and the look of crafting the score by hand and often she will start with structures on the page almost like architectural plans not of buildings but of the planes of sound that will become her piece and she thinks of the orchestral sound as this ecosystem it all belongs together in one whole, but within that you have different planes that merge and form and different colours that are brought out. So often when you're listening to her work, you're aware either of stasis or dynamic movement and how one sound, uh, I won't say bleeds, but merges into another. It's very, very subtle and beautiful. And she's playing with a sense of oral space and density and these kind of things. So that's why her music is often described as this intersection between um, symphonic music and sound art. It has that abstract quality to it while making the most of traditional symphonic sounds. It's interesting that given her aesthetic, she's not more drawn to the world of electronica. No, she likes uh, both the voice and choral works, but also in particular, the sounds of the orchestra and staying within that remit. That said, um, I have seen videos of works uh, of hers that use very subtle lighting 
and lighting effects to bring about this immersive holistic experience of the sound so that the lighting will buzz and tremor um, in sync with the acoustic properties of the music. So you're really drawn into that world in um, a complete and immersive way. And yes, as you can see from this photo for one of her earlier albums, there is a connection to her homeland in terms of its landscape. But again, it's less in terms of romantic themes, um, you know, the wilderness or, I don't know, um, alienation, whatever it might be, and more in terms of the aesthetics of it and the visual structures of the natural phenomena to be found in those landscapes. I'm going to finish then today's lecture with um, Aeriality, which is the piece that was performed in this symphonic tour and the piece that I got to know really quite well. And it starts with this spring from a platform, this thud, and we're launched into the air and suddenly you're looking at this landscape slowly unfolding beneath you and it feels as if you're both aloft and grounded by how she treats the orchestra. It's, it's quite a, a wonderful oral illusion. This is how it starts. You can hear the trembling of the wood of the bow and string there. Now I hope you can tell that this isn't the kind of music that you can play off an iPad <laughs> to be crudely recorded, but it's something you actually have to be in the concert hall experiencing live as this, well, these masses of sounds just form and ebb and flow around your ears. It's, it's a real experience. Um, and there is a moment actually in this that is perhaps less abstract to the ear, and that's where something that perhaps could be a folk song, starts right in the base of the orchestra and again just slowly emerges and brings momentary focus to the proceedings. Let me just play you that because it's a very powerful moment having had this ethereal quality to the writing then to have something as concrete as a tune emerge. Yeah. But here. This jarring proddings and then Almost like a deep Icelandic choir singing a tune. It's an emotional moment actually in the score when that happens, precisely because of its more abstract context, as I was saying. So it's only about 13 or 14 minutes long, this piece, but it says so much, and it gives you a completely different sense of aural space and landscapes, it takes you into a dream world. I think she's an incredibly gifted composer, and very, very exciting, and she's been programmed by top symphony orchestras the world over. So there you go. Those were my six composers. I wonder what you made of that. Quite a few contemporary sounds there, which in itself is exciting, isn't it? To just open our ears and embrace uh, new sounds and new styles of playing and listening. So we started with a, a glimpse of heaven, 
with Lily Boulanger and we've ended with a glimpse from the heavens with Anna Torrance Dottier. I hope you've enjoyed that selection and let's just hope that this wealth of talent that we're now experiencing, this flourishing of female talent, um, particularly over the last 20 years, is going to end up in a far better and fairer representation of diversity on the concert stage and elsewhere. So please do enjoy your summer, have a wonderfully sunny and safe summer and until I next see you, very happy listening. Goodbye.